Hello and welcome to A Case for Death Metal's Greatest Album. Today we're going to be talking about a huge one, Morbid Angels, Blessed Are the Sick. So joining me today are Anomalistic Offerings, yes, the Suffocation Song, Malice from Apocatastasis, aka Jack, and uh, Peter Jatta, who um, does some pretty insane guitar covers on Instagram of some of the craziest songs you've ever heard, and he does them in one take. So thanks for joining me today, guys. Uh, you know, you know, this is a really big album, very dense, incredibly influential. And, um, you know, there's a lot to talk about. So, you know, first and foremost, you know, let, let's get through the the preceding album, you know, Altars of Madness, another huge fucking album that could have been on this list as well. So someone want to start us off with the background? Well, Morbid Angel started back in uh, 1984 with uh, Try and uh, Richard Brunel. And um, I think they got uh, Mike Browning uh, along the way and uh, record tried to record uh, uh, the first album, Abomination of Desolation, in uh, 1986. And uh, actually, uh, like uh, four tracks from that album are going to be here in uh, Blessed Are the Six. But uh, yeah, they, they didn't release that one because uh, David Vincent recorded it and... Uh, he wasn't satisfied with the bass playing, uh, the drumming. So they actually re-recorded some of that uh, here with uh, new members. Of course, Pete Sandoval and uh, David Vincent on bass. Yeah, you know, I, th I think it was actually... Um, no, it was, it was a, a Bra Mike Browning, who you know later formed no Nocturnus, and uh, Trey Azlektot, who started the band, um, both of them, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and... But you know, it's yeah. funny because Abominations, like, uh, I don't know how guys, you, how comfortable you guys are with that album, but it's it's very heavy metal sounding, you know, it's much slower. You know, Mike Browning has admitted himself that, you know, what, that David Vincent would, like, harass them as a producer to play faster and faster. And, like, he was not good at that. Like, things would get really sloppy for him. Um, You know, and obviously, you know, the production didn't come out sounding great. And then, you know, obviously we get the fucking... Uh, you know, two guys from the legendary Terrorizer who come in and like fuck it, then push death metal to a new level completely. So, how would how would you guys describe you know Altars of Madness? Because you know many people would say like Altars of Madness is be is probably their best. You know, which is really hard to dispute. But you know, I'm, I always I always pick Blessed because it's so much more um, ambitious and it actually like manages to fully capture the ambition on display. Hot take, but. Alters is my fourth place, honestly. <laughs> Pretty hot take, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, because um, oh, go, go first. Or... Well, it's my third place, but uh, yeah, I I'll let you elaborate on that. I just think, I think that um, it's it's mostly reviled for not saying that it's like completely musically bereft at all, but it's mostly just like reviled because it's like you know the classic death metal album and it's like from the 80s so it's like you know more it has more of a mythos behind it because it's just so uh it pushed the boundaries but from like a contemporary perspective it kind of falls even though it's it's still a signature morbid angel style it falls a lot within the sort of like slayer type structuring and just like simple but like effective like chromatic riffs and it's like, it's just like Slayer, but a step forward for the most part. And they didn't really like find their like real niche until the subsequent albums. Yeah, I think especially compared to all of the like really overt, like heavy metal content on Abominations, Alters is more of a purely technical innovation for them. But Blessed is like the best snapshot of uh, Trey as a stylist, like throughout his whole career. It's like... Um, like the microcosm of everything that he had been doing up until that point and everywhere he would go afterwards. Yeah, but you know, I think what Alters does really, really well is that, um, you know, it it kind of updates what, you know, heavy metal should, you know, should be in a death metal context. You know, a lot of the songs like Immortal Rights, Evil Spells, all have these kind of, you know, catchy uh, melodies that kind of work a bit like a, you know, chorus or refrain that kind of, you know, always come around. <clears throat> And I think what puts Blessed above it is that, you know, sure, they don't they don't have the kind of 
immediate catch, you know, catchiness or the kind of very simple melodies. But everything is so fucking memorable. And the complexity, especially on the better songs, is pushed by a million. And it just fucking, you know, it just evokes something literally completely otherworldly compared to, um, you know, Altars of Madness, a Slayer 2.0 kind of uh, vision of, of metal. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Altars, uh, there was like bits and pieces still of like their more original style. It's not like they were just like Slayer, but more extreme. Like they still had stuff like Suffocation where they had those uh, types of chromatic riffs that are just like very frenetic and just like they're more textural than like explicitly like melodic. And I think that's like a very morbid angel type thing. I mean, definitely, you know, um, with uh, Tempestuous Might, you know, we did a video that how alters kind of, um, you know, every facet of alters was used by, you know, incantation, immolation and uh, suffocation to create something new. But, you know, obviously they pushed it much, much further than the kind of, um, you know, the minimalist abstract, you know, ideas that were there. Like on the alters. primordial death metal. Yeah, I mean, of course, dude, uh, you know, everything kind of flows out from alters. You know, if we were to make death metal, you know, I think we could arguably define death metal as being, you know, any kind of music, you know, metal band that takes its, uh, you know, where you can draw a line, you know, kind of lineage to Altars of Madness. But yeah. But so let's move on to Blessed. All right. So we agree. This is one of the most difficult death metal albums to to swallow, um, be it thematically, conceptually, you know, even the production is insane. You know, nothing is the same in it. two songs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, David Vincent is a god tier singer, but he does not sound the same in any two songs at all or anything. Trace solos each have like a million different effects that are never repeated, even within the same song. And, uh, you know, we've got a tale of two halves really in this uh, album. I wouldn't say that it's like, particularly like difficult or esoteric i mean compared to other morbid angel works it probably is because you know i think it's mainly production that like bogs it down because it's like very barren and dry compared to the albums the uh, book ending it i mean the production was also just a result of like the best that they could get to try to mix um death metal cleanly back then because it was just like such a new playing field for uh, music producers mm -hmm to work with so i think i really i think a lot of like all the most novel elements on the album are partially like a little bit of a product of its time and where they were as a band like being true like ambassadors for like a totally new style of music oh, yeah yeah and then i'd also say that uh the fact that uh, nick finds it uh like a uh, one of the most difficult albums to tackle on uh, morbid angel discography is also because it's uh I'd say it's full of sub subtlety and uh, it's uh, some of the things you might uh, miss it as, as like a first listen, but uh, well, we'll go over all of that. So, I mean, yeah, you know, the, the strange rhythms in yeah. each song, the strange, you know, like you said, it's, it's, it's all about the subtleties, you know, sometimes you get smooth transitions between different parts, sometimes it's completely abrupt. Um, the you know, the tempo changes are insane. I mean, and you know, what's crazy is they did this with no metronome. I mean, the sense of timing, it's very loose in this album. You know, it sounds almost like kind of free jazz thing where you've got a bunch of excellent musicians and they kind of have like an internal clock that for the most part is pretty in sync with each other. Yeah. I think you saying the, all like the subtleties, like the like the greater amount of subtleties on this album compared to the others reminded me of how they sort of like carved out their niche a bit further. Like one thing about this album, besides just like the sonic characteristics that are different from Alters, I feel like some of the structural elements have really like taken hold, especially when you look at the second half, which is basically all songs from their more thrash era. If you see how they like tweak those, Back in the thrash era, it was mainly just like your standard verse, chorus, bridge type songwriting deal. And it still is that, but there's a lot of strange like accents they do. Like they'll play the riff then they'll have like this very jarring and unexpected like tail that like tr uh, 
transitions back into itself or into another riff. And there's also just these little embellishments when it comes to like pinch harmonics and soloing. And it just makes it so the energy is like maintained despite having like a repetitive sort of song at like the bass. There's all these subtle changes and just like differences that maintain the sort of energy that would have lacked if they just copied it straight from uh, abominations to this. Oh, yeah, definitely. Especially with, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to say, you know, I, the immediate example I can think of is Thy Kingdom Come. You know, the kind of chorus, you know, ends with these weird, um, I'm not sure what exactly what they are. So that sounds like weird, really quickly played artificial harmonics that just give that song a lot more, you know, oomph. And the new riff that was added to Unholy Blasphemies to, I think that the the changes to that song, the way that they um, made it a little bit more concise and, you know, rapidly sped it up tightened up the rhythms and that like you can you can definitely tell that it's uh it's a newer riff because there's so much more like sliding and like gesture to it but it really um it really like turns that into a much more um effective track yeah yeah definitely. Uh, yeah so yeah it was mostly uh original uh, just a track with uh three different riffs uh, and uh a bunch of solos over the third riff, but uh, we've added this new riff. Uh, as Arospets uh, said, it's uh, uh, it carries the the impetus of like the new tracks, and it, uh, it just made it much more sh um, shorter and uh, fluent, and uh, also it adds the contrast of the previous tracks of the first side. Yeah, I think we all agree that it's like the weak, the weakest track. Not to say that it's like bad, but it's just that um, it was like the least um, sort of it was like the one one of the more simple songs from Abomination still, but it they still were able to like make it more concise because I think the original was like four minutes long. Yeah, which is sort yeah. of like crazy to think about. Yeah, exactly. and this is like cut literally in half, and they still managed to add more content. You know, yeah so yeah you, you know because i i do think you know with those newer songs they they just did not they, they did not want to be within that kind of like heavy metal hard rock space where you know a, a lot of the bands they they were into can repeat a riff for six minutes you know i think the, the one of the biggest influences they had in the early days were angel witch and if you listen to that album you know especially the kind of more metal songs like the chromatic ones like angel of death it is, for the most part, just like one or two riffs repeated in these really, really long songs, right? And I like the fact that they they strayed away from that, and you know, and and though we've all agreed, you know, that side B is the weakest side, it's still a fantastic, you know, there's still fantastic music on it, and it's still really, really well accomplished for this kind of a, uh, you know, pseudo primitive death thrash combination, you know. But obviously, you know, side A is where the main magic happens on this album. Should we go? Yeah. To the, should we go to the first song, "Fall from Grace"?
so uh, we've talked about uh, the the track uh, between us, and uh, we basically all agree that uh, Fall from Grace is like a big death metal uh, track, and uh, like it's, uh, we think it's a perfect death metal song in every way. If I was, if I ever was one, of course. So like. I learned it on on my guitar like a few months ago, and like I have it internalized uh, on my head, and like the the opening riff, like perfectly encapsulate the development of Morbid Angel sound. It's like a a, a doomy carnal chromaticism and sparse harmonies, uh, which are taken from their previous insertions on on altars, uh, to their apex in this album, of course. And uh, here the intro is deceptively simple. At first, it uh, it sounds like a, like a basic chromaticism, but uh, they use uh, octave chords and uh, occasional palm mute, uh, which gives it this uh, really demented sensation. And like, um, this is just the first riff. So, you know, it, we get to the second riff, the riff B. Wait, can and, I make a correction real quick? Yeah, sure. It's actually a major third, not an octave. Just wanted to clarify. No, the the chord in itself. Mm -hmm. the, the little the part that goes Jimmy. down. Uh, um, yeah, that part is like a ah, major yeah. third harmonization. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a... I, I heard it was an octave for some reason. I mean, there's both, but... yeah. I wanted to mention the the the, the major further later because it's uh, recapitulated in like uh, one of the climaxes of the, the yeah, part. and one of like the bridges where it gets like real slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like I think it's harmonized in octaves. Yeah. There's like a major third, but it's harmonized. It's something weird. Yeah, it's, but, you know, because yeah, I, I you know I found a, a tab for it, um, online that seems somewhat correct. But the, the problem with the tab is that it it kind of generalizes everything, you know. I because when I hear back, I don't think everything is harmonized. I think there are some notes that are randomly not harmonized, you know. Even you know there are parts where you look at the live videos, he's playing them in octaves, but here it just feels like I don't know maybe it's like his third finger comes on and off the string. Sometimes he's just playing one note, sometimes he's playing two. It's kind of hard to tell, and it's just so weird, and you know, gives this music such lively liveliness, right? Yeah, it's because it's what I said before. They'll sometimes throw in like a very abrupt like tail to like one of the riffs that doesn't exist for any of the other repetitions, just to sort of like throw you off. He has so, talked a lot. Uh, Trey, Trey uh, has talked. Technique. A, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. He has I talked finished. a lot about how he, um, how he like, um, at at this point, purposefully uses um some strange uh like playing you know some very non-academic um uh techniques and it was probably just um a result of him just like kind of physically feeling out the guitar like i think a lot of um a lot of the you know confusion whether he's like you know uh, harmonizing in thirds or octaves or like what exactly he's playing at some some of the ends of the riffs like it's probably like I mean, I, 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 I would bet that like between like different live shows, he probably just played it differently depending on how he was feeling. Like just like his solos, like I don't, I don't, I think there's um, on on a technical level, his uh, his style isn't very literal. Yeah, yeah, and uh, like what Nick said is also true. I think uh, I've also seen those tabs, and uh, there are some mistakes, but. Uh, uh, also, what Malus said is true. There's a measure for it, but uh, uh, it's basically this way because uh, I learned it on guitar. Uh, Trey plays uh, like an octave, and uh, Richard plays another octave, which are like three semitones apart. Which you can hear the the measure for from that one because if you cancel out a side from your ear and uh, just listen on the other one. You can see just you can hear just an octave, and it basically sums up as a measure for the sorts. So mm. yeah, oh, yeah, that probably makes sense because yeah. it sounded like I I heard the major th third, but it also seemed a bit more like uh high. It, it was it had like a higher pitch to it. It didn't sound yeah. like just like a straight major third. There was like a sort of a openness to it that made it seem. 
like it was a bit bigger than just, you know. This yeah. is admittedly where the production being as dry as it is probably doesn't do the album like too many favors. Mm. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the details are lost in, in there, you know, I mean, s sometimes I even feel like I'm imagining things or that I hear them for one second and they're not there. But, you know, like Jack said, you know, th there's just some weird things that don't occur in any of the, you know, kind of repetition matrices, right? And it's just really weird. But, you know, I don't think we can stay too long on this song, on, on the first riff because this song has, I counted, 14 individual riffs and there are a lot of repetition. I mean, the main question is, how the hell do you do 14 different riffs in less than six minutes without sounding like riff salad? <laughs> I mean, to be fair, like half of those riffs are just like motivically like built upon from like the previous ones, especially in the bridge. Yeah, but then there's enough contrast and difference between them that, you know, we can consider, consider them as, um you know, like separate riffs. You know, it's not like um what I'm thinking, uh, Dark Tranquility's first album, right? Nightfall, where it's like, Come on, man! It's 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 all the same motif, but just played a little bit differently. Like here, you know, despite the kind of common bass, everything is so different. You know, riff wise, like each riff st sticks in your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, moving on, uh, going getting to the second riff, riff B. So I feel like uh, the twenty fifth second, the riff changes. Uh, we see as a tonal center instead of uh, uh, how do you say this is in English? Uh, D it's sharp. In e instead yeah. of D sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we, which is basically a, a modulation uh, by a semitone shift. Yeah. And uh, you know it's a it's a simple trick, but that has been used to huge effect in uh, even in pop new music. So because it. Uh, imbues a song with a lot of energy due to the big differences between the keys despite it's the a, in, in in pitch i feel so, like it's more of like a gradual difference in here because like yeah. think about it if it was transposed like a fifth that would be like very very sudden but given like the chromatic nature of the first riff um yeah, like a semitone shift wouldn't like sound all that different because there's already like a ton of semitone shifts so it's more of just like a gradual building and that's like kind of emphasized by like the other changes like the changes in technique with like the chug mm -hmm. the staccato chugs combined with like the trems playing mm -hmm. those like strange sort of arpeggiated passages and like this uh, slight tempo shift to be a tiny bit faster but not enough to completely change the vibe of the song it's like getting you prepared for like the actual meat of the song yeah but you know but there definitely does definitely feel like um you know things are turning up right like the momentum is building yeah you know and i, I and i think it's definitely that kind of like shift upwards because you know i've heard a lot of pop songs where obviously it's all very consonant all very melodic right but well they'll do that for like the final you know huge chorus you know like a broadway song or something you know, where the, like, the of course, at the end, end, you know, where they have all the leads and everyone, you know, the whole choir singing, bam, they just move everything up, uh, you know, by, a, you know, a one note, right? Like a, a semitone. Yeah, they do. I think it's like either like a semitone or like a whole step. Something like that. Yeah, but it's like very classic kind of, you know, pop music, um, you know, slash musical trick. But, you know, here, here it's so weird to see how it's done. And it's not like, you know, hey, here's my shitty riff A. I'm going to play my shitty riff A, but slightly higher. You know, I've heard a lot of bands do this kind of crap. You know what I mean? Where it's like, dude, yeah. come on. It's the same thing, you know. But here, you know, it genuinely does feel like, hey, things are going to pick up, you know, before it breaks off into that crazy riff, you know. But, yeah, yeah, I think it, that's where uh, the subtlety comes in because it's a, it's a change in tonic, you know, but it's uh, supposed to be pretty important, but it fits in with... Uh, the elements that Malos uh, mentioned, like the already established chromatic riffing. So, yeah, I think I think I think we should move along because um, for, you know, for everyone watching this, you know, we will have the notes, but you know, we can't go go through the song riff by riff. I think, um, you know, the way I kind of characterize this kind of song in like vague terms, you know, I see as intro into the development into the verse, chorus, verse, chorus extended bridge climax right mm -hmm. with, with david singing you know and i think one thing that i absolutely love about this part is uh 
you know, most of the time vocals in death metal, you know, they can be great. They can be good, but they don't really change that much. But here, you know, the way the vocals absolutely steal the performance on the, on the verse riff is just fantastic. Actually, can we talk, wait, the verse riff is the one that goes like, mm -da 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 -da. No, and no, I got um, slidey crap. Not the, the uh, first the iteration of the riff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I want to talk about that riff, because that's yeah. like, to me, that's like the ultimate yeah. Morbid Angel riff. Yeah, go for it. Because it has basically everything that is just like indicative of like their style from this point on. You have... You know, the thrashy chug, they take that from, you know, their early period, but there's a blast beat over it. Nobody has, like, done this before. Like, people have done it probably, like, now, but they're just trying to copy Morbid Angel. Like, hearing that sort of, like, just thrashy chug that's just playing, like, a sort of Locrian sort of, like, melody mm -hmm. within it, that's, like, a very thrash metal thing to do. But usually it'd be, like, a skank beat or, like, a, you know just riding the ride but there's a blast beat over it and it's just very unintuitive because you usually expect like a tremolo pick part to be go over a blast but like the rhythmic sort of like uh feel of like these chug riffs combined with just like the chaos of like a blast it's a very strange sort of feel and that combined with like the sort of octave uh like atonal sliding and just like the very jarring shift between them is just, I don't know, that's just Morbid Angel to me. Yeah, I mean, also, you know, it, it you know, the song kind of starts with, um you know, it dis kind of descends, you know, it descends, the I mean, the riff. And then for some reason, it just kind of goes through this crazy slide where you're completely lost because you don't know if it's going up or down. And then, you know, you have this, the second tail that pretty much does the same thing, but except this time it does it with octave chords and it moves even more, right? Just, just, mm -hmm. you know, the whole thing is confusing, yeah. but I love it. You know, what I mean, it's, it, it, it's crazy because they, they can, they can take, you know, they create these very kind of like, um, these riffs that sing. If that makes sense, you know, what I mean, you don't need vocals, you don't need anything. The riff in itself sings. It's the melody, right? But they do it without, you know, adhering to any kind of like, you know, classic principles of what makes a good melody. Yeah, it's like those like atonal slides is just like more of like a textural thing. To me because you can't really hum those it just goes like <laughs> and, uh, the thematic unity within the whole song is actually like pretty unusual for a lot of death metal especially at the time where if you, you compare it to like a lot of the songwriting on uh, say onward to golgotha it's a lot more like episodic or all the, all the parts feel a lot more like divided from each other but given how embellished his style is i think the this song being more like um explicitly concise with its use of motifs and the other songs being um like pretty short and the then their structures just not being as labyrinthine as um it even was on altars of madness i think that it it delivers the same thing that death metal usually delivers but just like purely through the aesthetics of his playing mm -hmm. yeah completely all right but yeah this this song is just like ball from i think that's like this is probably the most like complex song on the album probably because yeah. like those ex those developments and the, the extended bridge they just like make so much out of like so little All and right. even though like the other songs are more simple i feel like this is sort of like the pinnacle you know this is morbid angel at their their peak Sins of hell. I am the liar. 
that like Locrian sort of like movement, but it's just edited so much that you could, couldn't even tell unless like you're like really paying attention because it goes like now. then it has the little chug into like this sort of weird dyad instead of doing like the slide thing. It's like one of the like doomy dyads that they took from like, you know, the first riff, like the tail ends of the first riffs. Yeah. And it's just changing from, you know, E to D sharp, just following that same sort of movement. And you have like these just sort of, you know, as Jem said in, in those notes, orgiastic sort of like sounds coming from like the lead guitar before it then abruptly like transitions into like this sort of like once appearing like solo riff and like it just never appears again. It, it breaks into that solo then it goes into one of the previous riffs as like the solo reaches its climax yeah i mean also with the, the solo it's um you know it's insane how like everything is completely irregular because i remember reading that what what trey would do with his solo is like he would look like at a specific part of the neck just like focus in on that and like imagine these kind of waves right that would tell where to tell him where to put his fingers on And he was kind Is of that like, something you made up on acid? <laughs> yeah, probably. And, then, you know, I think it was like the old gods who told him some shit like that, you know, and that he really believes in that. Well, at least he did back then, according to, you know, every interview. <laughs> But yeah, and he kind of shifts along. But I think, you know, um, much more specifically, what I think that comes from is Eddie Van Halen, because Eddie Van Halen used to do the exact same thing where he would take like, a, you know, three, four note, you, you know, pattern on one string. And he would play that throughout the entire neck very quickly in this kind of like really noisy kind of way. But like obviously nowhere near as noisy as this. And I think Trey just took that and pushed it like to a whole new extreme. Yeah, I know EVH solos are usually somewhat constant. And even if they have like those, even if it has chromaticism, it's usually just like blues sort of licks. Yeah. But this is just like straight, like atonality, basically. I mean, it is like in the harshest definition of atonality, this is definitely atonality because like it doesn't even have a tonal center. Like it's yeah. like the actual definition of atonality, not just like la just like not just like being completely chromatic. It literally just lacks any sort of like tonal center. Yeah, and it and it only makes sense, you know. I mean, I think, the, you know, like you said, the kind of uh, solo riff that he plays, you know, those really clean runs are like the cleanest part for some reason. Actually, give this entire solo meaning, you know, like, you know, if it was just random noise, you know, I wouldn't care, you know, like no one would care, you know, everyone's done random noise solos, um, you know, no one cares for obituary solos on the uh, slowly rewrought, right? But the fact that like it all goes somewhere and it has like. Um, a narrative within a narrative, you know, of like all this noise shit, like just kind of um, going towards like a really specific climax mm -hmm. just gives the like the, the solo complete meaning. And that's what makes it so good. Yeah, I feel like people usually like shit on these types of solos, like the Slayer type solos. But even Slayer had some examples where they did the noise type solos, but they did it in like a way that there was like a sort of narrative, like the Angel of Death solo. That's like a pure noise, but it's like one of the best solos in metal, to be honest, because of just like the dynamics and the amount of like, you know, just energy put into it, even if it like doesn't have any like explicit melodic content. And this can go for like, the best of Trey is morbid angel solos as well. Yeah, I, you know, it ties up to what he said, what we were saying about his riffs, you know, in that he, he's capable of making these melodies or, you know, what we perceive as being melodies from these completely textural things, you know, for some reason. I, I don't know how he does that. It's just insane. They kind of have a similar effect to a lot of like old, um, like mid-century uh, film music or like what you'd hear in the background of cartoons that was kind of like distantly influenced from like early atonality and 12 tones. So it just, it just gives it like a very like gesture oriented kind of feel in it. I mean, it's pretty much just like the, the, the metal trope of like doing all of that in the form of riffs that hold it together. Because aside from that, it might just turn to like complete bullshit. Yeah. Portal. Yeah, I can believe, I, I think <laughs> a lot of the, the Russian stuff, you know, there was like um, Shostakovich did the, the gadfly suite for that movie. What, which, ha you know, I'm not sure if you guys ever heard of that movie. It's like a mid fifties kind of, you know, a bit of a weird movie, right? About this guy who becomes like this radical and it's got like Shostakovich doing some really insane, like mm. chromatic and very dissonant stuff throughout the movie. Yeah, a lot of those like movie scores sort of cite like 
those like the Russians. I remember like uh right of spring. That was like a huge sort of like inspiration, like that piece to like a lot of like the atonality being used in like, you know, movie soundtracks when there's like trying to build tension. And, and with Rite of Spring too, like the fact that that was, you know, it, it was a ballet. So you can also like, you have the visual aspect of the dancers going along to the weird noises. And it's kind of like in uh, those cartoons too, where like that's, um, you know, music that otherwise white, that otherwise might be like pretty strange to listen to. Like it syncs up perfectly, like with the gestures, like the in a Tom, Tom and Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> This is slapstick music. Morbid Angel is Tom and Jerry core. D dude, they, they were watching Tom and Jerry like completely high. And I don't think they were smoking weed. Like there's nothing about this music that tells me, hey, we smoke a bit of weed on the side. It's more like, hey, dude, do you want to try this shit? I found it behind some lab they threw out in the back, you know? <laughs> Doing salvia, dude. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Freaking, um, what happens after the solo? Oh yeah, this is one of my favorite parts as well. It goes back into that second riff where it's like boom, ba down, boom, ba down. The staccato chugs and like the quick arpeggiated trems. But instead of being like gradual with it like this before, I mean it still is gradual, as in this is like the end of the song. This is the climax, but it's picked up so much energy. The tempo is way faster. Instead of just staying on the E like as the tonal bass it goes up to f as well and just mixes up the technique instead of like you know it just has a lot more like motion because there's more like 16th notes and stuff as the uh, riff reaches a climax the snare is like everywhere it, it's all in pockets still but it's just a more chaotic version of that riff and it really just expertly leads into the even more doomy section than like the one right before the solo, which is sort of like sort of extrapolated from this riff as well, but it adds that, uh, this is the riff that I was talking about that adds the major thirds within the sort of like where they're supposed to be like a slide. It's like boom, ban out, the little ban out mm. that's harmonized in those like parallel major thirds to give it a sort of a carnal and sort of like decadent feeling. And it's played very slowly with freaking David Vincent's gay cowboy vocals on top. Oh, man. Nah. You know, honestly, I, I think, you know, if you want to talk about the vocals quickly, you know, he, he just sounds absolutely perfect on this album. You know, even the kind of um, the very uh, braggadocious, you know, uh, spoken word part over the, you know, over that riff, you know, I bend my knee not for the way. You know, that actually mm -hmm. does, he actually does have like a lot of weight in his voice. I don't know why, because he, he said that at the t after Alters, he stopped smoking. Like, you know, in one day, he was like, he was like at two, three packs a day and he immediately stopped smoking. And, you know, his balls dropped a second time or something. And, you know, I think he's got, he's got a lot of weight and that's why he's able to get away with a lot of like these, um, you know, these things that would sound cringe because I think he, well, you know, he, he generally has belief in what he's saying, right? I mean, the lyrics on the throughout this album are pretty fucking insane, you know, like, you, you know, it's rock and roll degeneracy, like pushed to its limit. Not, I mean, not degeneracy, but like uh, debauchery, right? You know, sex, drugs and rock and roll, but like pushed to the absolute extreme. And he's very, very good at kind of like, you know, positioning himself in the center of all these kind of crazy riffs and, you know, making sense out of it with just his voice. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's appropriate that he kind of like, he takes on more of the the mannerisms of like a traditional like rock front man, like centering himself and like changing up, like, you know, doing high vocals versus low vocals for different songs and the spoken word and like how he was uh, presenting himself. I mean, if I, if I just had to guess uh, as an outsider, I would say he was probably the driving force behind the band. Like, you know, like the, the picture with like the naked chicks all around them and like the sort of image that they had started to adopt. And it's, it's something, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty rare actually that a band can kind of like make those kind of uh gestures or like include some slightly commercial elements but not have it be like a an artistic compromise like that hadn't that hadn't crept into the picture yet for them yeah i, I think pro fanatica dude <laughs> no but you, <laughs> in his case dude like this guy throughout his entire career right you know he he believes in that stuff, dude. Like the guy is sex crazed, right? Like he's not like, oh, I'm just a rock star, you know. We're here are some half naked women. Now nah, I think th that guy, like that, those were literally his fucking religious beliefs. You know, he even says in the song, um, 
all the treasures of Sodom now belong to me. I'll let you interpret it how how you want, but that means what it means, right? You know, uh, and even later on, he's the gay. <laughs> he probably is, dude. You know, blessed are we who live life in sin, right? You know, he he. But the whole thing is like, dude, I I'm not a Christian because I want to have sex with a lot of whatever, dude. I want to do whatever the hell I want to do, and that makes me feel strong because you know there are no taboos and no limits, right? And mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, I would say uh, some of the lyrics of Yavar Trucks are not as, like, uh, uh, they don't go back to, like, the hedonism of uh, rock and roll. But, yeah, I, I find I, I find actually some issues with, uh, like, uh, well, the form is pretty all right, but uh, the content of the lyrics, but, like, uh, at the core of, like, uh, the band, it's uh, the core inner inward motivation is that, you know, everyone thinks for themselves. It's like a don't tread on me type of thing, you know. Mm. So it's kind of, it goes back to the, the original idea of like uh, heavy metal, which is that, uh, that defiance of uh, as a masculine trait, you know, which... Uh, I think uh, kind of liberates you from like uh, societal constraints, and you know if you are oriented uh, towards the truth, you you end up at uh, you know at a good point. But you know there's a, a spiritual strength in that, in uh, in the core of that. You know, despite whatever David Vincent uh, makes of it, makes of it, so. Yeah, like ninety nine percent of like Satanism and metal is just like of the like the Levian kind, and you just yeah. have to look at like Merciful Fate. King Diamond literally has like pictures with bro, and it's like only like the Orthodox black metal like really tried to take it further, but that's just like they're larping. Not gonna lie, like nobody actually believes that, yeah, but that's just imbued into like that's just inherent to the heavy metal spirit basically, yeah. and this is just expanding yeah. upon it and trying to be like more blasphemous with it really and if you look at this retrospectively too i think it kind of shows how um david and trey are very like uh distinct artistically since trey is more like you know his his inspiration is more like from the like the direct um source material like reading the necronomicon and like studying all this like uh, ancient mythologies and like gnosticism like that's just like his his contributions uh, to the music just reflect that pure interest of his. And then David kind of molds it into something that can be used uh, symbolically for like self-liberation. So I think it's, it's not surprising that they had some differences later on, but here that, that contrast is really like essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, also one thing I noticed with a lot of, um, uh, you know, Trey's lyrics, uh, it's the complete opposite because he is kind of like Trey submits himself to the will of these chaos gods, right? You know, as I thought is literally the blind idiot God, right? He, he submits and he tries to live his life in accordance. Well, at least he did it when he was like super high, you know, now he's just a professional alcoholic. If you've seen that, <laughs> but you know, he was like trying to live his life in accordance to the will and, you know, unknown desires of all these, you know, insane gods that were, Partly based on Sumerian mythology. I mean, there are a few Kabbalistic uh, creatures that appear here and there. But, you know, it's like a hodgepodge of everything. Whereas, you know, David's like, nope, I am Belial myself, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's part of the reason why. Well, for me, Abominations of Desolation is uh, like one of the, the second best album from Morbid Angel because it carries that uh, deep belief in... Uh, uh, their own religiosity, you know, from Trey and uh, Mike Browning, and they, it, the the tracks which are here in the original context uh, make for a much more, you know, impactful uh, uh, effect for me. You know, uh, it makes for a propitiatory experience, if you know what I mean. Yeah. All right. Um. So, final notes about the this song before we move on. Yeah. After that little doomy section, doesn't it go back into like the main riff? Um. Yeah. Yeah. So it has the kind of big climax. You know, the real breakdown at the end. You know, what I mean, it's quite funny. Huh? Ah, rot in the sins of hell. Yeah. 
Um, you know, this is always one thing that, that's completely funny to me. You know, everyone says, you know, metalcore, deathcore, whatever, did those like multiple breakdowns in this song, in one song, but then Morbid Angel just does it so well. And, you know, they glide, they glide through the breakdowns, like these random, like really mm -hmm. fast tremolo parts. I mean, these Everything. aren't even like breakdowns in like the metalcore sense. There's not like that much, like there's a, some chugs, but it's like mostly melodic. It's still, it's just the melodic yeah. movement's just been simplified but it's not just like it also happens in like metalcore breakdowns but those are way more rhythmically in, like implemented or rhythmically based yeah. these are still in line with like the previous like melodic content and sort of like expands them it moves it forward it doesn't just feel like okay this is your head banging part no i mean definitely, to the narrative you know on the notes we all noted like you know we we all noted that a lot of these riffs are like a combination of you know b c d and e right or f sometimes they they take from themselves you know there's there is still a lot a lot of movement but you know in in terms of like um momentum I, I find it hard to listen you know to other bands that stick on such slow ideas throughout this kind of period of time you know which is why i struggle immensely with like later obituary and all that but you know it's done so well and mm -hmm. you know that final breakdown before you know it goes back to the kind of you know Go, go a b c right which is how the song ends just it just feels Actually, it's just a c it doesn't have the b right oh yeah, yeah 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 completely right yeah sorry yeah but, but yeah that's just like a little a succinct end it's like quite like typical where you just like end where you start but because the journey was so huge it feels appropriate especially as it's like the first real track on the album you kind of like expect it to sort of end in a slightly like predictable, but like anthemic sort of way, but it doesn't come off as being just like trite because of everything that happens between like the first point and like the last point where it all like wraps around. Yeah. You know, I, one thing I always found really weird, you know, I, it's very hard to kind of, um, to ascertain whether this is true or not but you know trey was always thanking mozart talking about mozart i mean i think the only real mozart influence would have to be the way he kind of comes up with that ending because you know i know a lot of people some people say he doesn't he's not inspired at all it's just bullshit and some people say dude um you know abominations is mozart part two of electricity right but i think you know i take a much more measured approach and i do believe there were some slight mozart influences and that's especially in the way it comes out in the way he ends the song because a lot of mozart pieces have that kind of like recapitulation of the the main theme but like cut in two or simplified or whatever to end the song and generally um from the from the blessed of the sick documentary um unfortunately they they didn't get trey for that but david was talking about how the the classical influences are more of like a basically a vibes thing like they wanted a sense of like grandiosity and i think that's i think it's mostly just reflected in how um uh, they were the the main songs all seem to be a lot more like intentional with how they're um with how they're structured and they kind of focus the most on like the the new uh ideas and new like um like playing gestures that they can interject and in. also like the the interludes and like the uh the thematic um feel but i mm -hmm. think that like i would i would agree that like trying to take the mozart comparison a little bit too literally is probably like it was it was probably just like a just like a vibes thing for trey it's, it's like it's sort of disappointing because like we sort of like have evolved from like the dmu sort of sphere which you everything goes back to composition and what you hear oh we were inspired by mozart and you expect it to be reflected in the composition but it's actually just like the fucking like neoclassical like midi interludes that's the inspiration from <laughs> mozart it's like oh it's a bit disappointing you know i mean I, I mean ultimately you know metal does not need classical to be its own thing or it doesn't or you know i mean i think some of you guys might be too young for this but like i remember you know we were like you know, 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago. This is jazz, but played by metal guys, you know, when fucking Tosin Abasi, what's his name? Animals as leaders and all that shit became really big. And then people just discovered Cynic again and <laughs> and jazz. No, no, no. We I I've I, I was there for that. Everybody was talking about like Imperial Triumphant, stuff like that too. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, well, one of the guys is like Kenny G's nephew or something. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I fall below the earth I smell the exit from The 
So yeah, it starts off more thrashy sort of riff, reminiscent of the early Morbid still, but has like this sort of like abrupt transition into the second riff, which I think is the verse riff. Completely different key change. Nothing shared melodically. It doesn't have to, but it's just interesting because it gives it a different sort of feel than like the first song, which is like very, very interwoven. Mm -hmm. This has like a bit of salad to it, but it's like a very intentional sort of salad. And it's also, um, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's more linear. It's probably just that my impression that it is because it has, it's shorter and there's less repetition. But yeah, I think there's only like a couple choruses. But something to like really note about this song is I think there's like a heavy possessed sort of influence with like the types of like chromatics that they use. Because if you like recall, I think it's the riff at uh, around like 30 seconds where it's just like complete like chromatic chaos and there's like no melody to it. It's just sort of off the rails. And that kind of reminds me of like some like possessed era, like songs where like they'll have like your typical thrash chug riff and then they'll just like cut out the drums. It'll be like a little Tom fill with like, mm. and it's just, I don't know. I got like a lot of like that sort of vibe from it. But Morbid Angel, I think, picked up where Possessed left off because they were somehow to take, they were somehow able to like take this just nonsense sort of like chromatic tale and develop it later in the song at around, um, when is this? Yeah, it's 128. Off to the second chorus. Yeah, it's off to the second yeah, chorus. Yeah, 128. Yeah. And it's just like those really, just this really quick flash parts. And it's being uh, ended by these like chromaticism that like just progressively gets more chaotic as like the song like reaches its like final chorus or recapitulation. I forget how it ends, but you know what I mean? It's it's a, actually a different chorus that is somewhat related to the, the main one that is played twice, but it has mm -hmm. enough, you know, it has such a different feel. If I, It's a lot less uh, cha chaotic, you know, there's a lot less like sliding movement, but it's very similar kind of thing, but it, it gives it a completely different feel. You know, one that's like, um, that very far, very much finalizes the song because you are right. If I remember correctly, the song is mostly linear, except for the repetition of, you know, what I call the main chorus, you know, which is a, uh, they speak my names and tongue part, right? Yeah. But yeah, but it, it, it's really well done. I mean, and also it's a short song, you know, it's like two and a half minutes and it, everything just fits together perfectly for it. Yeah, like you the songs on like the first half, even though they're like trying to upgrade from like the first era, there's still a lot of like very short songs, which you'd probably expect from like, you know, thrash metal because it's ba it's like based in hardcore. But here they like are having these like sort of linear epics that are only like sub three minutes and they're able to like make so much out of that. I think it's just they were they were taking like all the all the newest aspects of Ultras of Madness and just like condensing them down because there's there's that similar like intent that you would get in like um like immortal rights or visions from the dark side where like they move more explicitly away from uh from thrash. But there's I, I do think it's interesting that there are no like because those those two songs from Alters have some like they often get compared to black metal because they get a little bit more like consonantly melodic, but like they it's like he totally scrapped it for for bless and he just went back to like the most um like chromatic and gestural parts of his playing and I mean, they also yeah, that's like what i interpreted like the possessed influence where it has like the thrashy like um part that just plays around with like you know uh root note and then like a really immediate cut and then just like some strange chromaticism it gives it this uh the rhythmic sort of sense it's like, I'm trying to think how to say this. I keep on saying similar types of things, but it's like a very, it's a very particular 
how they do it on this song, especially on like this uh like riff at um let me re see let me read this. Yeah, one forty four. How it goes to that like da 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 da, then it has the little, mm -hmm. just like chromatic explosion at the end. It takes the uh, initial one, but just like ex makes it go higher. It expands the overall melodic motion, and it just is. It, he's able to develop a sense of narrative and consistency, even though these aren't even like melodic ideas. There's like not even like a motif that you can like you know call back to. It's just, it's just whatever. It's just bullshit. <laughs> I mean, you but, know, that's uh, what makes the composition for, for me so dense, and why doing this was so difficult because there are certain elements of um you know what Morbid Angel are doing that are very very hard to to express or to kind of fully understand, and then. You, you know, I fucking always hate man. Oh, bro, it's just about feels, bro. You don't get it. You don't get the feel. But here, there really is a huge sense of um, a feeling, and that you know, if any other band tried to do this stuff, it would probably like crumble down. Mm hmm. I think like yeah, a lot of like the more idiosyncratic aspects of Morbid Angel like haven't really been replicated, and I feel like that's most like uh present on like blessed because it has these just sort of explosions of like chromaticism usually what people take from morbid angel are those like doomy sort of uh like sections of like the parallel thirds like and like the blast being interspersed with uh different types of rhythm and those are cool those are interesting but a lot of like the more i guess um atonal or modernist sort of like ideas implemented have not really been replicated by anybody besides like them yeah I'm and i would i would say probably the closest the the closest would be uh orologium he also uh -huh. goes in some different directions uh from from portal uh -huh. at, at least at least if like any like major player in uh in death metal in the last like 20 years i think that um his style like could be seen as like a direct like successor to Trey's playing like or at least the most like weird aspects of Trey's playing and it's not it's it's not like a band uh like Mithras where like they take um a lot of the you know like the, the kind of like psychedelic uh stuff from like the Tucker era but then they but it goes more in like a, a modern like tech death kind of direction but i i definitely mm -hmm. think what he was what he, what he did with portal and especially what he did with um invocation which was his lesser known uh first band that i think that's like the only thing to me that really sounds like um an extension of these uh side a tracks and i would i would mm -hmm. recommend uh that split they did with stargazer to hear like the closest that i think anyone that's come to like um patterning from this mm -hmm. You know, it's definitely very hard to put into words, right? You know, because, you know, if we were to kind of condense it, it's like he goes up and down in random ways. Not quite sure how, <laughs> right? Yeah, there's like, there's a, an obvious motion to it. You can sense that it's like, oh, this is supposed to be a reference to this part. It's not just like, it is bullshit, but it's like, it's calculated bullshit. It's like <laughs> the finest bullshit. <clears throat> yeah. You, you know, there, you there's one... Feel it. There's one song for me on, on this side um, that I always always found super weird, but really like maybe the most kind of forward think, but not forward thinking, but in in its linearity and shortness is "Day of Suffering," right? Which just oh, yeah. starts with a super like chuggy part, right? Um, which we you know. We I want to. I'm sorry, but I want to take over this one as well because right, like, this is. I'll let you have it. Go for it. <laughs> I know you love this song. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I I lied about um brainstorm being my second favorite song. This is my second favorite song. Brainstorm is number three though. But yeah, day of suffering. It's the most linear song, and it's weird because the first like three or four riffs or so, they're basically the same. If you get rid of like all the embellishments, it's the same thing. It's like you have the root note, then you go to the, you know, six. Yeah. The minor six down below. Oh yeah, another interesting connection I made. I don't know if this is like too tangential, but Chopin's funeral march, everybody knows it. 
down, down. Same key as this first riff and the same starting chord progression. And I, I don't know if that's just like me and just like my stupid brain making this connection. But I feel like that is like a sort of funeral march type character because it's it has the doominess. It's in the same key, same notes. It's just sort of expanded upon because it goes like from the first to the six. But instead of like lingering on that six, it like kind of like bubbles below it too. Yeah. Like it, you want it to like go down to like, you know, maybe like the fifth. So it goes back up and it does, but you it kind of just like evades the fifth. Like usually when you're making a chord progression, it's like one, six, five, start over. Yeah. This is one, six, and then just adds this, these sort of like, dun, 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 dun. then you go finally to the fifth and making it resolve. It makes it sort of like creepy instead of just like purely like sort of expectantly sad or like doomy because it has just this bubbling under the surface feeling. And then it goes into the second riff, which is basically that, but the melodic motion is shortened and it's just like a bar long. It's like down, da, 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 down, 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 down. It's like they're kicking it in the overdrive. They can't even play like the first section right. The notes have less motion in between each other. It has like this sort of just like, Flight of the Bumblebee type, like chromatic vibe, because it's just, it's skating around what you think should be the melody, but mm -hmm. you can hear the melody. It sounds like he's either hammering on or sliding like really quickly between those notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, after that like speedy variation of like the second riff, you have this just tr more straightforward chromatic walk down with like the inverted skank beat. Da -da 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 it's the same thing. It's a bit simple. You couldn't linger on this riff for too long, and he doesn't. He plays it like twice, then he modulates a major third up and goes uh, da down, 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 down. Mm. He plays with that same sort of motion where it's like the simple chromaticism, but the chromatic pattern itself is being reduced by another semitone. It's playing off of that uh, simple other riff. And this is where, you know, David Vincent has his most furious belts. And the blast comes in mm. and just like all that combined with like this sort of strange major third key change just imbues a lot of energy within it. And even though it's like the same basic like chord progression, same basic melody, all of these subtle changes made throughout like I think this is like about a minute in is able to maintain the energy. But yeah, this like downward sort of uh motion gets interrupted by another key change back to you like your E flat, D sharp. And this is a more typical like thrash riff and it's all consonant too. It's all in the key of E flat minor. And instead of like emphasizing that like downward sort of descent, it's like now going up in like this consonant sort of way, like I wouldn't say it's happy because it's like minor, but it's like a lot more bright and triumphant. And um, they build upon this on the next riff where it changes the tunnel center, a step up to F. Now it's in the Locrian mode and it's building off that same motif from the previous riff, but instead it's pl being played with like a blast. And since the, you know, it's uh, the key or the tonal center is now F and it's being played in like Locrian, it adds a bit of edge to it that we like was not expected because the previous riff was more bright and kind of, well, like I said, not happy, triumphant, but this is sort of like going in for a second attack for David Vincent. He goes, takes another like, just like quick belt. You're like Celtic Frost type, ooh, and just like goes crazy. And then it ends on like this sort of like chromatic, dun, 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 as you expect from like a sort of like Locrian passage of those, uh, you know, your minor, your minor seconds and your minor or flattened fifths type deal but it's cool yeah i mean I, I just wanted to add very quickly you know what i think makes it work so good like you know a lot of these rhythms like they they've existed like many other you know even death metal bands have dubbed them at some point but i just love the way everything is chained together you know so despite the kind of you know melodic similarities or harmonic similarities you know there are huge shifts in rhythm which is something you know at the gates would do on um you know the red and sky is ours you know where they have like 
like three, four motifs and then make like five, six riffs with those, right? Really simple. But, you know, because I, I, you know, when the chugging riffs comes back, you know, do, 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 like that, that is absolutely perfect. It feels genuinely like climatic and, you know, almost conclusive within this song that's like not even two minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just like, I don't know. I just really like the sense of melodicism because as I said, it has those consonant intervals, which like, you know, harken back to, you know, some of like the gloomier classical pieces. I said Chopin's freaking funeral march, but it has the chromatic just sort of like Slytherin vibe to it. And that key change, major third up, major third, it's happy. Not actually. It's more of just like an ecstatic sort of thing. That combined with like the just the rhythmic like intensity and just like the explosive sort of like feel. All those combined this create this sort of like carnal ecstatic sort of like feeling, which I think is like very inherent to this era of Morbid Angel that I think didn't wasn't really on altars and they sort of forgot later throughout their career. Mm. All right, let's go to the sample. <laughs> So, um, you know, let's do side B now of the album, you know. So we have the kind of, uh, you know, three main songs are all, you know, not similar, but rely on a lot of the same techniques. So Thy Kingdom Come, Unholy Blasphemies, um, you know, Abom Abominations, and then the Ancient One, which is Ancient Ones, which is kind of its own thing. Is it? I kind of, they're all, aren't they all like the same period? Yeah, they're, 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 they're the, the same yeah. period. I mean, I'm not, sorry, yeah. But I think you know the, the ancient ones is different because it, it's a lot more um it sticks to its riffs, you know, so it starts out with a very kind of uh simple, you know, verse chorus with a lot of emphasis on the vocals, you know, very kind of bouncy, mm -hmm. thrashy, you know, rhythm. And then it moves on to that extended bridge where it ends the song, and it's also, you know, the the, the longest song on this side. Yeah. Well, it has the last chorus before the uh, after the extended bridge, and it brings one of the bridge riffs back then and uh the, with the interlude at the end yeah the kind of harmonized yeah, thing they do the thing is about uh, all these tracks we've said it before a billion times all come from early morbid and this is made evident by the riffing style it's a lot more bright and uh we said it was really comparative to like possessed and like how it it has this like death it's technique is in between thrash and death metal how it has like the sort of like frenetic and sort of like ruggedness of uh, death metal, but consonants and like use of pedal points of like thrash. But it's also also remains like somewhat consonant and somewhat bright. And um, you can hear that in like the, like the first riff on Thy Kingdom Come. Like it's quite happy. It's like all the songs or most, a lot of the songs from like Morbid Angel of this period 
had like these similar types of riffs like this song angel of disease first riff on that there's probably some others and there's also a riff i realized from day of suffering it's like that it's like the climactic one similar sort of character but yeah how they uh expand upon these songs with their new technique is really where uh we get some interesting stuff though because thy kingdom come it has more of those uh chromatic and sort of uh as jim would say gesture oriented riffs where it's more about like the motion rather than the explicit melodies and we can see that on thy kingdom come at like 120 where they add a pre-chorus which is just like this pedal point descending while they have these like quick slides that like you can't really make out but you can feel it's more of like a feel thing mm. and that just goes you know along with the the aesthetic that they're trying to portray of like this very like carnal fleshy sort of vibe yeah yeah and you know it has a lot of embellishments that were never there on the original version and you know while you know a lot of the kind of mentality people have around this uh you know death this kind of death knowledge like it's all co composition i mean this kind of shows that you know the embellishments and the changes in rhythm and, you know, all those little things you do are just as important as the actual substance of the composition itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, most of these songs, I mean, like all the songs besides like a couple are pretty much pop structured. It's just like what you do with that, like these little changes that really make it because um, even like the best of pop music, even if it's like, you know, on the surface, like a verse chorus, there's these like, more this there's this more implicit narrative that you sort of follow along like in between these uh repetitive sections and that's like very apparent in like these latter half morbid angel songs because like um before like we said about like uh fall from grace that those are like our verse and courses but that also is like very interwoven it's probably like the most um narrative track from like a very explicit sort of narrative thing but like these tracks have a lot less riffs than uh fall from grace of course but where the narrative comes out is more in these uh just like ups like highs and lows in terms of like energy that's spread across uh the repetitive riffs yeah it does you know, the the, uh, the, sorry, the structures no, that they choose i i definitely think it helps uh trey shine as a stylist because even even in like uh, some later Morbid Angel, whenever the songwriting might get a little bit like rocky or like underbaked, I personally like always appreciate like his actual riff craft. So I think that that um, that's it's it's always something that's really like driven the band. And I think that the the kind of like ambiguously bright feeling of some of these riffs, like it almost like it kind of like gives it like a musically like prideful kind of feeling, like which goes along with uh, David's like lyrical content. Yeah. It's like these songs are more, I'd say like anthemic traditionally, like these thrash metal songs uh, from that period. And I'd also want to bring it back to possess. Cause um, to me, like these songs are just kind of like an extrapolation of like the beginning possessed style where it's like these uh punky, like sort of high energy thrash riffs, but imbued with like a little bit of chaos in order to just like bring it out of its like comfort zone because it's like it's familiar but there's something a little bit wrong and you can tell how like morbid angel took that idea and refined it because they had their own like sense of melody with how they'll like combine these sort of like major intervals along with it to like give it you know a more ecstatic sense rather than just like purely like stupid chromaticism like possessed would do in some of like their riffs because there's chromaticism here of course but there's also some very deliberate like melodic choices that uh, are able to create the vibe that i guess the whole band wanted to yeah you, you know and of uh, uh, you know incredibly uh you know important note right is the fact that we, we have a much much better rhythm section here compared to like the initial um you know versions of these songs right and because of that, you know, uh, Pete and David are able to go much faster and much slower. And, you know, keep, uh, you know, Pete's drumming is fantastic. Always very varied, very kind of weird, idiosyncratic, like one foot blasts. Mm -hmm. 
and oh, weird yeah. snare work, you know, that, that keeps these songs driving and, you know, just the way they can just randomly shift, um, you know, through the tempos and the rhythms. Because, you know, if you go back to the Abominations versions of these songs, they're very um, monochromatic in how they kind of glide through. You know, sometimes they can feel a bit blurry because, you know, not only because of the production, but because of how, you know, each part isn't accentuated or, you know, contrasting the previous and the following part mm -hmm. enough. Yeah, when you mentioned Pete Sandoval's drumming, it reminded me of uh, Thy Kingdom Come. The main riff on that, the one, the bright one that kind of sounds like, you know, your angel of disease. Uh, originally, it starts with like this double bass beat. But after uh, a couple, after like that second riff, which is like, you know, more chromatic and uh, I say textural, they bring that uh, riff back. But this time there's a blast over it. And because it's very like chug chuggy and like chunky, it like gives the same feel as like the first or the riff on like Fall From Grace that I mentioned, where it's like the chugs, but they're overlaid with blast beats. And so it gives it a very unique feel. And that when that happens on like Thy Kingdom Come, it like automatically like shifts the feeling of uh whatever there was on Abominations, because you know, Abominations, I think they only have like one or two blasts on there and they're like not nearly as fast as like sandoval is doing on these songs but yeah taking those uh more thrashy chug oriented riffs and blasting over them is kind of another uh sort of tool to like the tool set of like this album that i saw utilized in this song as well yeah uh de definitely um and also what I think they do is that, you know, because Abominations doesn't quite have, uh, you know, a lot of those kind of weird harmonizations and like major thirds and uh, octaves and, you know, the kind of weird chords is that here they actually do implement them, you know, on certain parts of the song, some part of, of the melody. So despite not having the kind of, you know, crazy up and down energy that the side A has, there's still a lot more energy and a lot more, um, mm -hmm. you know, strength given to these songs compared to the Ab Ab uh, Abominations versions. I mean, yeah, just like it's it. They're not as varied, of course, because it still has the clear, like you know, base of abominations. But they are trying to implement as much of those embellishments as possible, like these sudden like tail ends and these sudden harmonizations and these more like sort these short like solos from Trey to just like accentuate the chaos and just like how it's played too was able to like gives these songs like a new character and new life and i'm sure if like if somebody like heard like these two like these two songs at like separate times and didn't know like they were like this like a version from like abominations and like a day later we play like a version from like lesser the sick and they don't know the tale they don't know it's morbid angel if we play those songs i doubt they'd be able to think they're the same song because it sounds that much different no oh, yeah definitely it's uh, it's a huge you know, and I think because of those, especially those tales that they add, that they're a lot more memorable. You know, I'm I'm always thinking about those kind of weird harmonics on, you know, just after the first chorus of Thy Kingdom Come, right? Where those kind of like, yeah, they do kind of really weird. Uh... Down, down, down. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Any specific parts from, you know, from these songs that really come to mind? The verse of that kingdom come whenever it really starts uh getting going just like the way that they keep on like he keeps on adding all these like strange like uh like like interjections to the rift and like how the like it's it, it it's a blast but it has like a strange like choppy pattern i mean it's i think it's almost a little bit similar to like a lot of the hammer blasting and like early suffocation or some of that stuff that would later leak into like brutal death metal mm -hmm. kind of technique like it's it's a really um it's a really like it's not it's not like a, a like a like a metronomic use of the blast beat like uh was more prevalent on altars of madness but it, it i mean it's, it's kind of it's kind of the same for like um uh the verse on uh fall from grace that uh malice was talking about earlier how the blast like you know like really contrasts in like a strange way with like the choppy um the choppy riff that it's going over it's i think it's kind of a similar case here Bye. 
Okay, so let's move on to this album's kind of, you know, legacy, you, you know, uh, where a lot of these kind of, you know, classics that we reviewed on the previous episodes have very obvious descendants. I can't think of one, you know, I can't think of a blessed are sick, the sick clone, right? I mean, how do you guys think that this kind of album's legacy, uh, you know, went, you know, came out in death metal? Yeah, I can think of clones for like, altars and covenant and gateways of a lot of the kind of newer death metal bands really being obsessed yeah. with that one and formulas to an extent but um yeah nobody has really like done blessed because um as we said it's an extension of like the old style altars but it's just given new life and it's like it's less straightforward than covenant because covenant of course they overlap mostly on the technique but Covenant is like a more streamlined, I wouldn't say, I don't like to say mainstream, but it literally kind of is mainstream because it's like the most best-selling death metal record. But yeah, it's just um, Covenant just sort of like got rid of a lot of the stuff that would be way too far. And it's just like, I wouldn't say it's safe edgy either. It sounds like I'm insulting Covenant, which I don't mean to do. But to me, it's just like, it doesn't go as far as like you know this album does in terms of the strange techniques and i think that's why people kind of like neglect this album and you don't see a lot of like what was happening here and sort of like caught in like this time capsule of like late 80s early 90s death metal that was just like throwing shit at the wall i think because of the stuff. prominence the the prominence of the vocal hooks on this one too like you can you can definitely listen to this album like it was a pretty straightforward like death thrash or just kind of like lump it in with like uh like osdm like you know back back when everything was simple but i think all all the nuances of this one are really like um uh they're not like they don't they don't like jump out at you immediately if you like don't pay attention to the music so i think that um I think and and for the band too I think it was like a mostly experimental release so they didn't like a lot of a lot of like the little idiosyncrat like idiosyncrasies on this one or like um the kind of grandiose like classical kind of feeling like those those were just like um those were just like passing like phases for them and it probably it probably wasn't even done with that much like conscious intention so I think it, it just ended up being like um just like a really like um explosive and kind of avant-garde release while also being one of their most like streamlined ones and also the sort of um uh the sort of cultivation of their image that they were doing and like doing their first big tour and like um you know getting a music video on mtv for the first time like i think that that um it just like in the history of their career it just helped to grow their presence a little bit but the actual content is kind of forgotten for that mm-hmm yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense because it's like, this is like, <laughs> they're heretic, but 10 years ago, and it's like, it's actually like somehow their best album instead of being heretic. <laughs> yeah, well, I would say it's interesting that Aerospats um, said it was like uh, an experimental record for them because. Uh, you know, one of the bands that uh, Morbid Angel in this period really admired is uh, Voivod. Here they they already released the Killing Technology, Dimension Atros, and the Nothing Face. You know, doesn't really have anything to do with the style, but they, they really admire the approach of like going for the variety within their own language. And here, I think, try reached uh, flu full fluency in his own vocabulary and like uh, I don't think anyone really comes close to well uh, it, they don't come close to the style because this album reflects try for me so I don't even want to hear another Blessed Are the Sick but uh, you know Nick mentioned uh, Gateways people really uh are drawn to the groove side of things, you know. They don't uh, consider the rhythmic uh, side of things as like a component to enhance the melody, mm. as uh, this album uh, really does, you know, so well. But yeah, I, I don't think I, I can think of, you know, someone that 
you know, uh, is really influenced much from uh, Belasse Darbosik. Like the techniques that people borrow from this album are the techniques that are present on the other like Morbid Angel albums, yeah, not like those exactly. ones that are specific. As I said, yeah. if they're going to copy Morbid Angel, it's going to be Altars or mm -hmm. um, Covenant or like the Tucker era. Mm. Yeah, you know, I, I think the funny thing is that no one has ever disputed like this album status as an absolute classic of the genre, right? And I think because of how idiosyncratic it is and how insanely subtle and how much of kind of like it reaches like such artistic heights that, you know, it is definitely the peak of that style of um, death metal, you know, the kind of, if we trace the direct, you know, death thrash lineage, I think this is like the one that ends everything. And that, you know, like Peter said, that there's no point in trying to ever come up with something like this again, you know, this is completion and, you know, it's, definitely one of the best albums and you know i know it'll be an album that we'll all be listening to until the day we die right mm -hmm. totally yeah i like how like all the songs are pretty much like uh separate from each other too well like a lot of songs on like even like the critically acclaimed albums i say somewhat like blur together like some of the deep cuts on altars or uh uh even covenant but here it's like um all the songs I can like pick out like which one is like which if you just like give me like a riff because it's just like even though it's all a similar style it all sort of um they each have their unique identity which I find interesting like the closest thing you can do is like probably Thy Kingdom Come and Unholy Blasphemy is being somewhat similar and Abominations and Ancient Ones being somewhat similar but even then it's not like a complete blur you can it's still you're still able to like tell where like one starts and one ends i do think compared to later morbid angel too um trace trace style like while it's fully developed it's also like less um like standardized or self-referential because i mean i i like i like the tucker albums a lot personally and i would i would say formulas is even my favorite overall out of their discography but i do feel like um like whenever they go fast on that album for instance there are some like riffs and moments that kind of feel like they're really like chaotic and weird like sliding parts on blessed but they're all like standardized to being like you know this is like a fast part so we're just going to do like a hyper blast like underneath it whereas all the um all those kind of like gestures and idioms that he um mm -hmm. like first developed on this are like used in a lot less um uh like standard ways yeah, I think if like if they like had like the time to like really like perfect and hone like their sound for this era that we heard on like the A, the A like sides, it would probably like because I agree with you with like formulas being the best. If like if this album was just like Fall from Grace or like uh Day of Suffering, Brainstorm tier songs like all about i'd say that it would surpass formulas but it's just like sort of hindered that they kind of had to throw these old tracks on for like you know just to like get something out there because in that case it would probably be um even more genre defining than it like is right now mm -hmm. yeah and i i do think that with with how trey's like playing developed too like this album it, it doesn't really have like the the hypnotic quality that you want to get out of the rhythms and like the the Tucker stuff and even on like uh, Kingdoms, which I feel like you know as as much black as that album does sometimes get like there is um there is like a a more like um a more creative use of like groove and rhythm and like polyrhythms like on that album even more so than a lot of like the gateways clone type of bands or like the groovy you know like your average like groovy death metal kind of band so i think that trey like just kind of ended up going in a little bit of a of a different direction like in a, I mean, in a he way had the potential atmospheric yeah he had the potential given that the title track is basically like that yeah i mean you know so many styles are hinted at you know same with alters but you know alters was a lot more uh in you know foundational for the development of death metal you know this un unfortunately you know uh, Morbid Angel would play around with the style, you know, as much as I do love Covenant, some of the later stuff, they they were never 
as important or you know genre defining as this you, you, you know i mean they they never hinted at anything new again as much as i love those other releases you know everything can be found on this album 